news starts right now. San Antonio police say there is still a lot they don't know about a shooting that turned a downtown building owned by the San Antonio Express News into a crime scene. The victim is a 62 year old man who staggered into that building on Avenue E earlier this morning. As Katrina Weber reports, police say he wasn't able to offer them any clues. Inside a building owned by San Antonio's main newspaper, news unfolded just before four this morning. San Antonio police say they received a call about a shooting, then found a 62 year old man wounded in a breezeway at the San Antonio Express News' downtown building. The man who they believe may be homeless was suffering from a gunshot wound in his neck when he made his way into that area off Avenue E. He was rushed to a hospital with a life threatening wound. Police don't believe the man had anything to do with the newspaper or its staff. They believe he simply came here looking for help. Because of his injuries, he wasn't able to speak to officers, not even to tell them where the shooting happened. Investigators searched the downtown area looking for that crime scene and carefully went through the building looking for evidence. In the end, though, they didn't come away with much, only a few items of clothing and some unanswered questions. Katrina Weber, KSAT 12 News. San Antonio police making an arrest in connection with a murder case from this past summer. 22 year old Elisa Weiss has been charged with capital murder. Investigators say she drove three men to a house in the 8600 block of Limpkin Court back on July 14th, where they killed Jasmine Williams. According to police, the, the people in the home were able to identify Weiss and some of the other suspects who have been charged in connection with Williams's murder. All are facing capital murder charges. San Antonio police and Crime Stoppers hoping some reward money will get them closer to solving a murder case from more than 10 years ago. Police say 17 year old Paul De Leon was a was riding in the passenger seat of a car when another driver pulled up next to him. Someone fired a shotgun hitting and killing De Leon. That was in December of 29, 2009 at the intersection of Fair Avenue and New Braunfels. So far, all police know about that suspect vehicle is that it was a white Nissan Frontier pickup truck. Anyone with information on this case asked to call Crime Stoppers at 210-224-STOP. Well, there will be no in-person jury trial, civil, civil or criminal, in Bear County until April 1st at the earliest. That's because of an emergency order from the Texas Supreme Court and the local administrative judge. Paul Venema now with a look at those orders and their impact. This central jury room will have been vacant for over a year before jurors could possibly return under the latest orders. It's incredible. We never would have imagined that. Local Administrative Judge Ron Rangel ordered a moratorium on jury service last March as the COVID-19 pandemic began. While it remained in place, judges began to worry about their case backlogs. Are you receiving pushback from other judges on, the, on, the, on your orders? I was receiving some pushback from a few other judges in November and December of this past year. I think as a result of the of the pandemic and where we're at now, I think that's gone away. The case of Otis McCain, who's facing capital murder charges and possible execution in the slaying of veteran police detective Ben Marconi in 2016, is among the high profile cases included in the backlog. I do not know when we're going to resume jury proceedings on that case. Um, it's possible it won't be for another month or two. Individual interviews with prospective jurors had begun last fall, but was suspended when the COVID numbers began to soar. As for the actual beginning of testimony in the trial. Once we select the jury, I do not anticipate starting that jury trial until health conditions permit, and I don't see that happening for a while. Paul Venema, KSAT 12 News. New at 6, officer discipline will be at the top of the city's priorities as it begins negotiations with the police union next month on a new contract. Priorities laid out by city staff today include adjusting timelines in the disciplinary process, what past behavior can be considered, and limiting what arbitrators can overturn, leaving the final decision on the level of discipline to the police chief and city manager. If the final discipline is appealed and undone, then uh, the process uh, hasn't worked, regardless of the process itself. So we're trying to stay very targeted on that final discipline. 
Looming over this is the effort to overturn the union contract entirely. Petition signatures are currently being verified to put the collective bargaining process itself onto the city's May ballot. If voters approve, then after any active contract expires, police discipline procedures would be governed by what's in state law instead of a negotiated contract. The same group is also trying to get those protections onto a ballot, too. The city and SAPOA will meet for the first time on February 12th. That current contract expires at the end of September. I, Joseph Robinette Biden Jr., do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. So help me God. Congratulations, Mr. Thank President. You. No longer president-elect, Joseph R. Biden, the 46th president of the United States, taking the oath of office during an inauguration ceremony unlike any in modern history. President Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris taking office amidst historic crisis in the country. An uncontrolled pandemic, a crumbling economy, and while trying to help heal a nation with a deep political divide. President Biden's historic choice of Kamala Harris as his vice president, first South Asian, first African American, first woman, has inspired a lot of young people. As Harris had said, I may be the first, but I won't be the last. Jesse Degriado spoke to some students in the San Antonio Independent School District about what they say was a truly unforgettable day in their lives. Howard University's marching band was there as its famous alumna was making history. Kamala Davy Harris, I solemnly swear. Kamala Harris took the oath of office as the nation's first female vice president from its first Latina Supreme Court justice. Watching it all were three students, each with their own perspective. A South Asian from India, like Kamala Harris's family. It's great to feel, to live through a moment like this. A young African-American inspired by what she'd witnessed. It's changing the norm meant so much to me. It only empowered me to continue to keep going. You can really do anything nowadays. It doesn't matter your gender, your race, anything. You could get anything done. Even having a second gentleman, the nation's first, who he says should be an example for young men. You, you gotta be supportive and everything, you know, just as everybody else would support you. We've learned that quiet isn't always peace. Moved also by the words of the country's first young poet laureate. Everything she said is so true and is only just gonna encourage me to continue doing what I'm doing and make change. But they also realize President Biden's call for unity applies to them as well. Do you think you're up to it? I think my generation's up to it, most definitely. Jesse DeGoyado, KSAT 12 News. Members of Vice President Kamala Harris's beloved Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated are sounding off tonight. They're speaking about the historic moment their sister was sworn into the national office and the impact it will have on the future. As Devin Clark explains, for members of the country's oldest black sorority, today's swearing in was 113 years in the making. It's absolutely amazing. The emotion is overwhelming for Jackie Gorman, the current president of the local Alpha Alpha Xi Omega chapter of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. I am just beyond proud. Gorman says to see her sorority sister, the now vice president Kamala Harris, who joined Howard University's Alpha chapter of Alpha Kappa Alpha in spring of 1986, being the first person of color and a woman to take that oath of office, symbolizes a dream realized for her sorority sister. Alpha Kappa Alpha was started by women who were one generation removed from slavery. You know, 113 years ago. Fellow AKA Shalonda Davis says she noticed leadership qualities in Vice President Harris when they met at a sorority conference years ago. Just to have that moment to speak with her, you know, no cameras around and just have her share with me as a black woman was something that I will never forget. Today, the bells at Howard University rang 49 times before the president's inaugural address. The moment meaningful for fellow AKA Kristen Castillo, who like Vice President Harris was also initiated into the sorority at Howard University and never doubted that this day would come. We have always had the skills, the uh, competencies, the confidence, um, 
and the tool sets necessary for us to ascend. These sorors say the vice president's representation is renewed proof that anything is possible, regardless of race or gender. Now, if these were different times, we'd likely see AKAs throwing celebrations throughout the city. But of course, COVID-19 has put a halt to some of that. But I anticipate, and AKAs know what I mean when I say a lot of pinkies will be in the air tonight. Devin Clark, KSAT 12 News. Take a live look outside with live cam tonight, 52 degrees, and this has kind of been the picture all day. Yeah, it's just been damp and a little dreary, but not the type of dampness that really puts a dent in the drought, really helps us out much. Rainfall from days past, on the other hand, very beneficial, and the aquifer still responding up a little bit today, up half a foot. Now we're exactly four feet below the January average. Today, just a trace of rain measured at the airport. Some reduced visibilities out there as well, even right now. You take a look at the readings and the airport visibility of one and a half miles, two miles, Bernie, up to three miles now in New Braunfels. The drizzle will be coming and going through the rest of the night. Temperatures pretty much holding steady. We're 49 in Comfort, 51 Stinson and Rio Medina, 52 at the International Air Airport in town, near 50 tomorrow morning. More drizzle and dampness. We'll talk about a warming, a warming trend coming right up. San Antonio Metro Health, and this is our COVID-19 update for the San Antonio community. Tonight we have, wel have a welcomed drop in case numbers. We're reporting 850 new cases of COVID-19, which brings our total to 153,081. Our new seven-day rolling average has dipped to 1,966. Unfortunately, we also are now reporting 18 new deaths to report. Um, uh, which occurred over the last 14 days. They range in age from <laughs> their 40s to their 90s. Please keep their friends and their families and their survivors in your thoughts and prayers this evening. Tonight we have 100, excuse me, tonight we have 1,466 people fighting COVID-19 in area hospitals. That's actually down 41 from yesterday, another welcome uh, drop in, in cases in the hospital. We do, however, have 174 new admissions in the last 24 hours, as well as 452 people in intensive care and 247 on ventilators with COVID-19. So again, these numbers, uh, we're seeing some drops in, in the hospitals and on the daily case count, but we do look at those over a period of weeks. Uh, to make sure that we're seeing uh, things that aren't just aberrations from day to day. So we'll be watching these numbers over the next couple of days. Let me turn it over now to Judge Wolf. Yeah, thanks, Mary. yeah one day, you, you never know. It is good to see that, but I was very disturbed to see another 17 or in, uh, in ICU, which um, I don't know what that means for one day. Hopefully that doesn't mean more and more people are really getting sick. Uh, let, let me first of all thank uh, Donna Health. Uh, from Be Smart, I had the opportunity to work with her uh, and Moms Against Gun Violence, and she sent me uh, a mask, and I want to thank her uh, very, very much for that. You know, one one point that I, I thought was important, and, and that's why we've talked so much about family gatherings and why people getting together socially is dangerous. Uh, the the uh, contacts that uh, Metro Health has made. Uh, they have found that the vast majority, 92% of close contacts, that means when you're close, that's when you're liable to get a really bad dose of it, <coughs> who were interviewed knew <coughs> and knew where they were infected, reported that they were being a household member of a case. So it, it got, it, you got it at home with a larger uh, grouping probably. Only 3% mentioned being in a grocery store or a public or <coughs> shared transit. Another 3% of schools, daycare, health care. So it's the larger gatherings that, um, where people get together and let their guard down. So we saw that happen over the holiday season uh, from Thanksgiving all the way through, um, through uh, New Year's. And that's why we have such an exponential rise in cases uh, for the last two or three weeks. We're hoping it's going <clears> to <throat> slow down now. I was out at the uh, Wonderland Mall just uh, a few minutes ago. And uh, looking at what we're doing through our Bear County Hospital Districts on vaccinations, uh, we're doing uh, teachers uh, and school personnel in contact uh, from 5 o'clock to 8 o'clock every night. And I think tonight was San Antonio Independent School District. 
and we're doing about 400 of them every every day f- during that time frame. Uh, on uh, Martin Luther King Day, we were able to do about 12 or 1,300 of them because they were off on that day. So that's moving along pretty good. The good thing that we're getting ready for, and cross your fingers if we get the um, vaccine, uh, we're on one level of Wonderland Mall now. We're working to get on the second level. And on that second level, we're going to double our uh, stations to get the vaccination. And between the second level and the first level, uh, we'll be able to do 5,000 a day. Uh, that's a significant increase. And, uh, and, and we hope to start that on February the 8th. But, of course, we've got to have the vaccine to be able to do it. So we're hoping um, it's a big day in Washington today with the inauguration of President Biden. And I know he's going to be paying a lot more attention to this, and hopefully uh, he'll be able to get the supply coming in at a quicker pace, and we'll be able to do vaccinate more people every day. Great. Thank you, Judge. And we know many people are hurting uh, during this pandemic and want you to know that there is assistance available for you. In fact, we were just notified of additional assistance we will be receiving from the federal government to help augment our emergency housing assistance program. If you need help paying rent uh, during this period of time, there is assistance through our emergency housing assistance program. You can get some encouraging numbers in today's daily briefing, hopefully numbers that hold up over more than just one day. We saw more than 2,000 people yesterday. Today, 850 new cases, uh, less than 2,000 now in the seven-day average to 1,966. Unfortunately, though, 18 new deaths were confirmed today people ranging from their 40s to their 90s. Yeah, and as you heard there, there was some interesting insight in terms of where these cases are coming from. 92%, as the judge said, are coming from close contacts, people in your own homes, 3% from things like out, uh, public grocery stores and things of that sort, and another 3% um, happening in daycares and schools. So yet another reminder that it's so important to just remain in your household and, and not get together for family gatherings. Yeah, also interesting listening to the county judge giving us a bit of news there at the end that they are hoping to expand operations at Wonderland of the Americas Mall from, they do about 1,500 shots there a day. They wanna up that to 5,000 shots a day starting February 8th, and of course, all of that is supply willing. We've been getting a lot of calls from people saying they've been calling 311, they've been trying to make appointments, uh, and they just can't get through, or when they do, they say they are out of appointments. It's frustrating, we know, but it's more of demand out, out stripping supply right now, and that's just the way it is, but 311 is the best number to call to try and schedule some of these things with the city. Indeed, turning now to weather, 52 degrees out there right now, Adam, and just a gloomy kind of gross day. Yeah, and not much real rain to yeah. show for all the dampness, you know, damp off and on throughout the day, but only a trace officially at the airport, despite wet roadways, road spray, and you need your windshield wipers periodically. But that's what we get in this kind of a weather pattern. Take a look outside. This overlooks the airport and you see those little speckles on the upper left hand side of the camera there. Well, that's that's the drizzle activity out there. Visibility down to a mile and a half with that air temperature of 52 calm breeze out there and we do have reduced visibilities elsewhere as well. Kerrville, Bernie, New Braunfels, Hondo, all at or below three miles visibility. And this patchy drizzle is going to come and go. Maybe we'll get a few hundredths of an inch here and there, but that's it. So it's not the kind of activity that really helps with drought conditions. It's just more of a nuisance on the roadways more than anything. Even Catula, four miles for their visibility. But you look at the radar and there's no real activity. This is just that drizzle that's below the radar beam. A few showers just clipping northwestern. Valverde County, but that's it. And last night, early this morning, we had some good rain out west. We're going to have more of the same here tonight and into tomorrow morning. Notice 6 a.m. tomorrow morning commute, low clouds, fog, drizzle, reduced visibilities, not much to show for the moisture, and the dampness is going to linger on into the midday and afternoon, though I do think we could squeeze in some sunshine farther west along the Rio Grande by tomorrow afternoon. Temperature-wise, 40s in the hill country, 50s most elsewhere. 
You look at temperatures, Gonzales 58 along with Beeville, Victoria still at 70 on the warm side of that frontal boundary. So near 50 tomorrow morning, steady temperatures tonight, 65 by the afternoon. We get into the 70s with sunshine on Friday and then more sprinkle and drizzle action late Saturday with Sunday featuring a few areas of light rain, but still 60s and 70s this weekend. All right, thank you, Adam. All right, the Spurs continue their West Coast trip and they Head to San Francisco tonight. Yes, uh, the Chase Arena, I believe it is, and uh, it's a new home of the Golden State Warriors who spent all those years in Oakland. Now they're in San Francisco, and Devin Vassell looks to uh, protect the ball like he's been doing so great for the Spurs this season when he plays tonight. And we have an update on Chiefs QB Patrick Mahomes coming up. Two in a row, the Spurs will face the Golden State Warriors tonight to close out their short two-game road trip. San Antonio is 8-6 and six and 5th in the Western Conference. And when it comes to protecting the ball, they are number one. They lead the NBA 10.5 turnovers per game, and their assist-to-turnover ratio is also tops at 2.44. Rookie Devin Vassell is 5th in the league and number one amongst rookies, and he leads the Spurs with an assist-to-turnover ratio of 5.7, which can mean more ball control. You know, every possession is valuable. You know, that's that's what I take away from it. So um, you don't want to do anything that's going to be stupid and lead to a, a turnover going the other way and um, give the, the team another opportunity to, to go on runs and to get, you know, to get some stops, get some ducks. Um, so that's kind of what I hang my hat on. Pop recently said Vassell is a natural basketball player. Today he was asked how does he feel about his rookie season? I mean, I feel like it's going great. Um, you can't hang your hat over makes and misses. Um, at the end of the day, you got to be an all around player, which is getting rebounds, getting blocks, getting deflections. If your shot isn't going in, um, you know, you got to do all the little things. If your shot is going in, you can't just be a scorer. Um, whatever I can do to help the team, that's what I do. Um, and that's what I'm going to continue doing. Golden State has won 6-10, and they beat the Lakers on Monday night 115-113. Tonight marks the first game of the season between the Spurs and Warriors, but because of COVID-19, Pop and Steve Kerr can't hang out before the game. Ordinarily, Pop and I would probably go get dinner or something tonight, have a glass of wine, and be able to discuss what's happening in the world, and, and I always look forward to that. But during the pandemic, uh, we're not allowed to do that kind of stuff, so that's not going to happen. But uh, I do look forward to to seeing him, and his team looks great. They're really they're really playing at a high level. Spurs and Warriors will play tonight at nine local time from the Chase Arena. Pro football coverage powered by Davis Law Firm. Kansas City Chiefs starting quarterback Patrick Mahomes did practice today as KC gets ready to host the Buffalo Bills Sunday at 5.40 p.m. for the AFC Championship. Mahomes was hurt in the third quarter Sunday against the Browns and remains in concussion protocol. Here's head coach Andy Reid after practice. They look good. He's just, uh, he's in the protocol, so they, there's only certain things he can do and and it's a limited basis, but today is a little bit limited practice. So he this fit right into what he could do. And and um, but he took all the snaps, and you know he feels he feels good. So I mean, we just we're just going to follow this protocol uh, as close as we possibly can. In the moments after Mahomes was hurt by Browns linebacker Mac Wilson, Mahomes' mother Randy tweeted her reaction, number 51, evil never wins. Now Wilson tweeted back saying he's glad Pat is okay and that he's not a dirty player. So Randy Mahomes responded with thanks, and this was Mama Bear just having a hard time watching it. Long count, snap Rodgers, fakes the hand up, bootlegs right, pump fakes once and again, takes it himself to the end zone, he's in there, just inside the right pylon, touchdown! Packers fans can relive the biggest moments in the Packers divisional round win against the Rams in Lego form. I love when Lego does this. Green Bay will host Tampa Bay Sunday afternoon, 2.05 for the NFC Championship. I, the little Lego guys yeah. even doing like the, the actions that Aaron Rodgers was doing after yeah. he scored. I think it's pretty cool. Yeah, that's cool. Thanks, Larry. <laughs> we'll be right back.
It is a historic day in so many ways. So our KSAT Q&A going to talk a little bit more about the inauguration and where we go from here. And we are pleased to be joined by Professor John Taylor, the chair of UTSA's political science department. Professor, always a pleasure to have you on. Your main thoughts about what you saw play out in on those Capitol steps today. Well, we saw unity, first of all. We saw continuity of government. We saw, among other things, if you looked at how Biden talked today, he talked about reaching out across the aisle, that you may not like him, you may not have voted for him, but give him a chance. Um, it was a message, I think, that was hopeful. Um, I, I don't know if it's going down in the history books, say John Kennedy's kind of a, a, a inaugural dress or Franklin Roosevelt's first inaugural dress, but it was a good inaugural dress, and I think it sets the tone for Biden's administration. You know, you, speaking of that and, and hearing those tones of unity um, throughout that address, given what has happened, not just with the riots in the Capitol that we saw recently, but also just the, four, the past four years that the country has seen, what do you think that unity will look like, if any, moving forward? <laughs> that's, that's a really good question. Given the contentiousness of the election, given the last four years of the contentiousness of the Trump administration, it's not going to be easy. I mean, this is where the Republicans, I think, are facing a problem because Donald Trump is the first president since Herbert Hoover to have lost majorities in the in the U.S. House, U.S. Senate, and the White House, um, all within one term. Republicans are hurting in this regard. Are they willing to to basically, you know, put a hand across the aisle to help Biden out, especially when it comes to COVID nineteen and 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 getting the pandemic under control, economic relief? Uh, particularly as a result of the crisis that was a result of the pandemic. Those are two really pressing issues, and I think that's where we could see, I hope, some bipartisanship. We are already seeing the president take some action, some that include South Texas. He said we're going to stop the construction of the border wall. Do you, see, ex do you see more executive actions taking place than maybe what uh -oh. we see in the Senate? Oh, absolutely. Um, among other things, uh, we're, we're going back to the Paris Paris uh, uh, climate uh, climate accords, which means we're, we're basically rejoining that, uh, which means we're going to be looking at, at green energy in the future. Um, we're talking about, or not talking about, we're going to rejoin the World Health Organization. Um, we talk about the border. Not only are we talking about uh, Trump, uh, excuse me, Biden eliminating or stopping the building or construction of any more of the wall. We're also talking about a pathway to citizenship. And part of it has to do with repealing certain certain executive orders that Trump had against uh, those that are undocumented in the United States, as well as people that were trying to travel from majority Muslim countries into the United States. Keep in mind, this is likely very likely the first step toward legislation this week or next week uh, to try to engage in probably some of the most comprehensive immigration reform in the last 30 years. I want to ask you a little bit about the transition and the days leading up to today. Because the transition did not go as smoothly as it historically does, how do you think that's going to impact these first few days of the Biden administration? And do you think they'll be able to make up a lot of that ground that they lost? I, it, it's not easy, obviously. You're, you have to hit the ground running. Fortunately, the people that Biden has in place are people who are, for the most part, have had experience in previous administrations, the Obama administration, uh, the Clinton administration. They have substantial policy experience. That said, they need to get up to speed as to what's happening within their departments, agencies, or programs. And that does take a little bit of time. The lack of a transition was not helpful. It actually was damaging to national security. It was damaging to the economy. And it and it, we are fortunate that we have people who have experience in these positions now. All right. I want to ask you a question here, John. You talked about the fact that Democrat, that, excuse me, that Republicans are hurting. They've lost the White House. They lost the Senate. They are not the majority in the House, but they don't have huge majorities over Republicans either. So when you've got a 50 50 split in the Senate and I think a five vote difference in the House, does that lend itself to cooperation or does that lend itself to gridlock? One would hope it would lead to cooperation, although if 2001 is in the indication, this is when we had the last 50-50 split in the Senate, you had a Republican who defected to the Democrats and the Democrats had control of the Senate until 2002. There was a lot of gridlock then between uh, between the Bush administration and, and Democrats in the Senate. And it's not just it's not just in that circumstance, you've had it before in other circumstances. So there is this issue, can we see bipartisanship? I, I think it depends on the issue that's in play. Um, um, I think Biden can get some early wins, especially when we're talking about economic stimulus. 
that one I, I think especially is important because there's a lot of broad support to get the economy moving. Same with the pandemic. People are worried. People are scared. They want deployment of this vaccine as quickly as possible. And that's, I think, where we'll also see some cooperation. And last question, if I may, when we look back at this day in history, is there a particular moment of today that you think uh, Americans will, will just walk away with? Lady Gaga? Oh, no, sorry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> she was great. Yeah, so was she the was. Poem. It, it was, to me, it was wonderful watching watching the face of America, a woman of color delivering the, the Pledge of Allegiance with sign language, no less, a Latina administering the oath of office to the first woman of color, first woman, vice president. Uh, there, there, there are so many things I think that we can come away with from this inauguration. Biden's message of hope, his, his, his sheer joy of being president, I think, really stood out as well. Professor John Taylor, the chair of UTSA's political science department, always great to get your insight on days like today. I appreciate your Pleasure. time. All right, thank, thank you. you. We'll be right back. The Better Business Bureau sending out a warning to people looking to commemorate this day with a collectible. Be careful when buying inauguration memorabilia online. The Bureau says if you're looking for official gear, be aware that there is a lot of counterfeit merchandise being sold at lower prices. But that lookalike gear is often made with poor quality images. And buying online through scam websites can potentially steal your personal information. The, BBE, the BBB gets thousands of complaints regarding misleading social media claims. You know, I was thinking about that today because I've covered, I covered both of yeah. George W. Bush's inaugurations. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about the fact that there are so many people that sell souvenirs mm -hmm. that surround this, that there are no crowds, yeah. no sales. Just another fallout, it's more fallout from the pandemic. It, just all the vendors too, you know, the yeah. street vendors that sell hot dogs and right. corn dogs to pretzels to the actual restaurants around there too. There's, there's a lot of people affected. You, not good visibility out there, you can see there um, an I-10 and 410 interchange at Crossroads, a little dampness. Roads are still a little damp out there because of our patchy drizzle, 52 degrees right now. Temperature not changing much the rest of the night. We're going to hold steady around 50 degrees, give or take, through the night and even first thing tomorrow morning. More dampness, warmer temperatures, and we'll talk about our weekend rain chances coming right up. Monarch butterfly is getting closer to extinction. According to the Xerxes Society, less than 2,000 of those butterflies were found on the coast of California, which is one area or one location where they are counted. Yeah, I'm curious what the count is in the yeah. refuge area you went to in Mexico. By the way, that's nearly a 100% drop since the 1980s in the California location. The findings based on data collected by volunteers who visited nearly 250 sites from Mendocino, California, to the Baja California, Mexico area. Researchers say breeding, overwintering, and pesticides among the primary reasons the monarch butterfly population is dropping. Plant that milkweed. Well, if you are feeling a little cheesy today, don't fight it. It is National Cheese Lovers Day. So go ahead and order that cheese pizza or that side of mac and cheese. Cheese has a special place in Americans' hearts and diets. Oh, yes, it does. Well, we don't know how making cheese began, but the earliest record of gooey goodness dates back to 5500 B.C. And if you doubt the country's love of cheese, Check out the National Day calendar. There are 18 cheese-specific days honoring cheese in some shape or form. Literally, shape or form. Happy National Cheese Day, Adam. That just confirms what I've always said. There's, more, there's a million of them a year. 18, more than one per month, these cheese days. It just doesn't make sense to me. How can it be a day when there's 18 of them? Well, each cheese deserves its own day. There's more than 18 cheeses, I'm sure. Um, well, maybe not every cheese deserves its own day then. <laughs> we could go on and on. Okay. <laughs> All right, let's go outside, take a look at our time lapse since 4.30 p.m. And you really see the low clouds, that drizzle coming and going. And this patchy drizzle is going to continue. And here we go. We have an update from a trace to one hundredth. 
of an inch of rain. Ooh, uh, yeah, it's actually measurable today. So today we actually officially have measurable rain since our last update at the airport. 47, that was our low. Then our high was 52 degrees, so cooler than yesterday and well below the average of 63. Visibility is down. We've got issues in terms of wet roads, a little bit of road spray because of our dampness, and of course, reduced vis visibility. So exercise caution on the roadway, especially from New Braunfels to Bernie, Kerrville, Castroville, Hondo, and basically downtown San Antonio and northward, the south side of San Antonio. The visibility is not as much of an issue. Oh, Kennedy, their visibility just dropped to four miles. If you look at the, ra the radar, there isn't much out there. This is all that really fine, light, drizzly rain that's below the radar beam and very low in the atmosphere. So you don't really detect it on the radar screen, but you see it in the live cams for sure. Check this out over the past 12 hours. A good chunk of Texas, especially north central Texas here, getting some much needed rainfall. We've got a good weather pattern that's favorable for this rain with this big dip in the upper level flow near the Baja Peninsula and this big surge of moisture coming from the Pacific up above us. So that helps out a lot. One of the reasons why we had rain around here the past couple of days. This pattern is going to flatten out a little bit, but we'll still have some periods of mainly just dampness more than showers to talk about. So let's look at our future cast. And tonight is just more of the same. The drizzle coming and going. You'll wake up to low clouds, reduce visibility, wet roadways for the morning commute tomorrow. Not much to show for it. If we're lucky, a hundredth of an inch here and there. And then we get into tomorrow afternoon and we'll still have the low clouds in place. It's going to be hard to really dry out uh, much tomorrow. We'll have some sunshine west of San Antonio, but that's probably going to be it. Then we get into Friday and I think we'll all see the sun. As for rain chances, it's hard to really quantify this drizzle and sprinkle activity. So in terms of actual showers embedded within it, maybe a 30% chance tomorrow. Same story into Saturday, but by Sunday, I do think we could actually have some real scattered showers. Don't expect big accumulations, but activity that's more noticeable on the radar screen is a good way to put it. So we had that cold front move through yesterday. It's not overly humid out there. I mean, dew point right near 50 locally, but you see that mugginess right along the coastline there, right on the edge of that boundary, which stalled out to the southeast of us. And in turn, still near 70 degrees in Victoria, 61 right now, Corpus Christi, but in the 40s in the hill country, Kerrville, for example, at 47. And meanwhile, Pleasanton 53, along with New Braunfels, San Antonio at 52. Tonight, temperatures not moving much, more pat patchy drizzle, some fog and drizzle to start the day tomorrow at 50 degrees, and then near 60 by noon and topping out in the 60s tomorrow afternoon. I actually think we'll make it into the mid-60s for most of South Texas, even a little bit warmer closer to the Rio Grande where we get sun. But the next several days, much warmer than today, even when you include the sprinkles and the dampness, which will return a Saturday evening, and then Sunday I think is going to be a fairly damp day with drizzle, sprinkles, and then a few embedded showers here and there. So. If you're a sun lover, Friday's your day. Otherwise, this weekend looking fairly gray. All right. Thank you so much, Adam. In case you missed it, coming up next. Here's today's In Case You Missed It. But first, it is a historic day in Washington, D.C. Joe Biden will be inaugurated as the 46th president of the United States today, right around noon. And 78 years old, he will be the oldest president in American history. New this morning, firefighters say a house burned down on the city's east side. This happened just before 3 this morning on the 200 block of Westfall near I-10 in Hackberry. Firefighters say the homeowner was a hoarder and that all that stuff in the attic caught fire quickly. They also say it took a while to extinguish because of all the items inside. And vice investigators are still trying to figure out a cause of the fire, but they say the home has been destroyed. An Antonio police officer charged last week for misuse of official information arrested again today. The police department confirming officer Eric Rodriguez now also facing a charge of bribery. Officials telling us that charge is related to his arrest from last week. This is the mugshot from that previous arrest. Investigators say Rodriguez accepted money in exchange for providing information to the suspect in a domestic violence case. Rodriguez was out on bond from the original charge, but was taken into custody again. Joseph Robinette Biden Jr. do solemnly swear. 
Joe Biden swearing his oath of office, becoming the 46th president of the United States, his term beginning at one of the most troubled moments in American history. Biden takes over as the country grapples with the COVID-19 pandemic, a ravaged economy, a racial reckoning, and deep political divides. Biden focusing first on unity. We must end this uncivil war that pits red against blue. Before we go, I want to show you I-10 at Callahan. Not so much because it's traffic troubles, just gives you an idea of what we're dealing with at this hour and kind of been dealing with throughout the day. Just kind of, what'd you call it, drizzle? Yeah, drizzle because it's just drizzly and doesn't add to add up to anything, unfortunately, but except a hundredth of an inch now at the airport. So it's better than nothing. It is, but uh, it causes some issues sometimes when you're driving and on the roadways. You just need to use the wipers a little bit, make sure your headlights are on. And there's the, a look at the actual visibilities down to three miles at the airport and Castroville, two mile visibility, Bernie, two and a half Kerrville. And those visibilities, they'll be fluctuating throughout the night and even the morning commute. The morning commute should look just like what you saw out there on Transguide. 50 degrees in the morning, cloudy and 65 by the afternoon, not much of a breeze tomorrow but warmer and into the 70s with sunshine on Friday this weekend. I really think clouds are going to dominate fairly gray with more sprinkles and drizzle late Saturday and then some showers into Sunday. Right. Just rain if it's going to rain. Yeah, that's where I am. Right. Just like if it's going to ruin our day anyway, just rain. See you on the night beat at 10. Good night.